firstly, the, the day in life of, of um, Andy Cowan, uh, peak hip hop connection. Day in, I mean, day in life is it, it, really getting up six o'clock in the morning. Six o'clock in the morning because it's trying to trying to get some stuff done before the telephone goes. And then before email goes, so, so these, mm. these things will, will be going all day, and then that's a lot yeah. of negotiations. It's just in terms of dealing with words, do you know, doing doing some editing while it's quiet. So yeah, yeah. so and what doing editing while you're not on the phone? I mean, yeah. it's a mad delegation, de- delegating time through the whole day and space to be able to put the creative touches to something. But in yeah. the meantime, you you're trying to negotiate an advertisement deal whilst you know, like you say, yeah. four hours ahead. Eight hours back, whoever you're having conversations with on the phone it might be another part of the world. Yeah, you you, you are multitasking, and there's, there are times you just say, you know, you turn the answer phone on because you you're never going to get anything done. You just have to, you know, hunker down. But um, you know, what did your family say? What did your family say at his peak? Like, like what? Hardly anybody saw you. Killer Killer podcast. Killer Killer official dot com. Street Culture TV. Fox created. Killer Khaled. And we're here to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Khaled podcast. Does that feel all right? Yeah, that's all right. That's, that's, that's cool. So, yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Khaled podcast. Um, welcome back. Not that I'm even considering you've gone anywhere. You need to be here nowhere else. Central London or as central as you need to be. Um, big shout out to all the shares and carers, people that are getting involved and spreading the gospel on street culture and more beyond. Um, and if you want more of that beyond, hit the television app, free download, iPhone, Android, for all your sporting art, uh, extracurricular from mini docs, big docs to the podcast that you love. We're here, we're out here, we're in the space. Get yourselves ready for the upcoming Hoddle Wars. It's time to graph punks up and get up with some NFT gaming. Also, big shout out to Chief Rocker Gear from streets to stage. Chief Rocker is the streetwear of champions. And my goodness, this space that I am in right now, I was just saying to my guest, he's about 75. I've got to argue 80% of the reason why. <laughs> Why I'm here even doing this, why I, I'd even got into the creative arts of uh, hip hop and street culture and more. Um, he was a conduit, he was one of the forerunners of documenting hip hop um, and uh, black music uh, monthly in a magazine called Hip Hop Connection. Get in! And uh, while we're here, he's got a new book called B Side that we're going to be checking out. Just been gifted, can't wait to go through that. The man, the myth. He goes by the name of Andy Cowan. How are you? I'm very good. I'm very, very good indeed. So nice to see you, Keller. Hi. Good to see you too. Wow. I mean, I was, you know, again, gushing slightly the fact that um, for years, me and a handful of others out there, majority of my, my, <laughs> my um, viewers have, you know, installed like huge amounts of volumes of your magazine in their, yeah. uh, in their shelves over the years. I mean, that's... That must be quite a, a, a thought, huh? It is. I mean, I've been, I've been thinking about it a bit recently. Mm. Uh, one of our writers, Andrew Emery. Big up Andrew, uh, yes. Yeah, he's got, he's got a book coming out in March it's called uh, right, uh, right Lines, Adventures in Hip-Hop Journalism. And so I sent him my archive of mags and he's been going through them to kind of put a narrative together for his memoir. And so they, they, they kind of came back to me and, and it's 200-odd magazines. So, you know. Wow. It, it, it's a whole thing, so you can't help but sort of you know, look back and delve in and, and it's kind of mind-blowing. I think particularly the early ones, you know, mm. pre-internet, mm. pre-everything when we're doing anything, everything analog and, you know, by fax and, 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 and trust a lot mm. of the time, setting up stuff and then things happening. And, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's kind of, it is kind of mind-blowing looking back how, you know, how shonky things were, were set up, but still it kind of worked. Shonky? Okay, you know, that's an interesting yeah. word. Yeah. Um, with, with a monthly magazine... Now, I do these two times a week. Yeah. Uh, I always, always, you know, there's never enough uh, speed in making an album. It's like, you know, you wait two years for something to come out. Of course. If yeah, you're even yeah. happy with it. But, you know, yeah. with this, it's just like cut, 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 out, out. There, there must have been that as well where you were, you know, these, these books that, that, that you know, this more recent one, I mean, that's a life's work in itself. But to, to break that down into a magazine where, where it happens every month, I mean, that's labour intensive, particularly for back then, right? It is. No, it's really labour intensive. So you have, you basically have a lot of people running on the ground for you, so writers, photographers, mm. whatever. So so everyone's doing a little bit. Uh, you've got to bear in mind that you're working in hip hop time, half the time, which is mm. say four hours behind GMT mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So everything happens really late. 
probably doesn't happen on time or doesn't happen at all. So you have to make these little contingencies always that, you know, you have to anticipate that some stuff will not happen. Mm. So you have to have something, you have to have subs ready to come on if you like. Uh, and, um, you know, cover stories get pulled at the last moment, albums go back, all, all these, there's mm. all these sort of factors. So you're, you're, you're running sort of, you're running a B team as well as an A team sometimes when, you, when you're doing a magazine and having, you know, you're having a, a lot of, a lot of stuff and you're, and you know, you, 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 doing three or four at the same time mm. generally. So you're, you're always planning ahead. You got me thinking there, because sometimes lastminute.com on podcasts, someone would say, no, I don't want it out now. And it'd be like on the 11th hour. Yeah, and yeah. thank goodness there's a, a back, you know, contingency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how often, because that just raises my heart, the pressure's, my pressure's even thinking about it, um, when you describe it, because you've got so many moving parts in the magazine as well. What if you'd like, I don't know, lost the cover? Um, the, the, the main cover story or something. Cover like. story, cover story is, is always the one. So we had loads of occasions where a cover would get pulled at the last moment no or we didn't way. have any, or, or, you know, you'd get, we were reliant some of the time on record labels sending in decent photos and not getting decent photos yeah. and getting, you know, just, just some, some rubbish that you have to kind of manipulate somehow around or, you know, we didn't have a budget to, to pay agencies or anything like that. So it was, you know, you'd have to be a, a little ingenious to... to try and work your way around it i always thought you know when I, andy cowan the editor you know he's this mystical dude that just seemed to get shit done he was just you were just this you know when it said editor in the magazine and it, it, you know you were always a constant and but you never i don't ever see you in a club or never see you you know hanging out in hip-hop circles like that so he added this kind of air of like well, I like, don't know I, I'm sort of ninja like in my anonymity mm. in a way but there's a couple of reasons for that I mean one uh, I was editor but also as we get into the 90s I'm the only person solely working on the magazine so I'm kind of doing admin mm. picture filing everything else as well as as well as the magazine running mm. it so I'm just I'm just done I'm, I'm up at six in the morning finishing six at night and I, I you know if I go to a jam I'm not I'm not working really the next day so I have to to parcel my time out carefully to to make it work and I think the other thing was I didn't want to be too visible on, on the British scene in itself uh in terms of compromising what we were putting into the magazines uh, so because you so, get too so, close to the flame almost yeah yeah I mean you know it's sort of as a contrast to that, with someone like Paul, Paul H, Paul, mm. I'm assuming, who's, you know, yeah. who, was in the, yeah. who, who was everywhere in mm -hmm. the clubs, you know, yeah. taking for people's photos all the time. And he would, uh, you know, he would actually get all the, all the moans and groans and, <laughs> and complaints. <laughs> so you get more moans and groans mm. than you do uh, mm. when you do uh, compliments. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Paul would be frontline, kind of kind of on that, and I'd, I'd, he'd feed back to me. But, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it wasn't, I don't think I was consciously being, you know, being anonymous or anything. It, it, was, it was just... The daily grind in, in a lot of senses. But you don't want to be uh, swayed, do you? Like, yeah. I feel you on that. If you're too close to the, the candle, like you're, you're going to be. Some things are going to be said, and you're going to. Well, you got to be pretty thick-skinned to, you know, accept certain things and carry on. You know, some things might dictate a whole. Yeah. Episode of the magazine. No, exactly. So we did. We were sort of owned by ministry for a while, but just over just over a year. So we were in a sort of reachable location, if you like. Mm. So so we did have a few sort of sort of uh, aggrieved artists sort of turning up turning really? up at the door at the offices and stuff. And and uh, you know, I'm I'm quite diplomatic. It's it's all right, but you know, but you can see you can see how things could sort of sort of escalate pretty quickly. Escalate quick, if if it wanted to. Because originally the magazine was in the middle of nowhere. It was in yeah. a place Ely, which is kind of fifteen minutes outside of Cambridge, but yeah. it's it's could be, yeah. You know, it's it's a little market town masquerading mm. as a city, so you know, you'd never find it. <laughs> that is <laughs> yeah. so funny. And it was just weird, you know. It was a weird setup because it was owned by uh, a company called Music Make, and they owned a load of music, well, musicians magazines, so yeah. guitarist, keyboard, That's review, right. and all that. Yeah, stuff. Yeah. There was one Music Technology, which was mm. the only one sort of almost a sister mag, which was you know, had people like Tim Goodyear and Simon Trask who wrote mm. for it originally, who you know do the more technological side of hip-hop. But the rest of it, we were kind of a bit out on a limb, so, mm. to say the least. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting, that whole idea of it, you know, because I get all the time it's... You're, ultimately, your contributors are voicing an opinion that isn't always one of your own, but they'll say things, especially the singles and album reviews, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm. there's, there's, but then you get... The, you get the thankless task of putting out something that 
gives maximum exposure. But as soon as there's somebody with a bee in their bonnet and you didn't write yeah, anything, yeah. that's that's some sort of responsibility right there, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's not, not particularly nice. But at the same time, you want your writers to have opinions. They want to have contrasting opinions sometimes. So one writer will really like Tupac and another won't. But mm. And actually, that's fun within a magazine. And, and writers should have different opinions and readers should gravitate towards different writers. Writers maybe who sort of... You know, sort of have a similar world view on hip hop to themselves, but uh, yeah, you know, there's there's, there's arguments and, and and there's there's beefs, but you you just take it as part of part of a job, I guess. So, mm, yeah. Part of the agreement. Yeah, right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For for sure, as as a young killer Keller <laughs> used to send demos to Hip Hop Connection. I'm sure you remember Prime and Keller and things. I remember like Prime and Keller. We used to we used to, we actually used to play it a lot. It's fantastic. Did so you? yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Good, so you know. That's where I first heard of you. So yeah, and um, ninety-five. That was 94. was it ninety-five? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. It would have been. I know Stephen Worthy was on the magazine. So yeah, mm-hmm. ninety-four, ninety-five. Definitely, that kind of makes sense. Mm. So, a rudimentary yeah. demo tape alongside a, a friend of mine at the time called Prime. Big up Prime. I've never actually said his name on the podcast. Big up. Um, but you literally saw a lot of new comers. You must have got so many. There's so many examples like myself that. You know, you wanted to maximise the opportunity and you know, communicating with the, you know, the, the, the um, uh, reporters within the magazine and, and get demos through. I mean, big up Andrew Emery. He was actually the one that I'd sent it to and he yeah. was just gracious enough to give us like a special feature. Yeah, and I know. We, I mean, we, we were reliant on, on what came through the door. We, you know, we got a lot of really terrible demos that, you know, you couldn't possibly cover or, or, or do anything with as anyone who's you know worked in a record label knows you know 95 yeah. percent it's probably going to be unlistable the same with <laughs> you know a certain amount of records but we did try and mm. you know listen to everything and if it was something good try and spotlight it and give mm. it you know give it something so was that was that your first sort of review yeah, ever anyway the first review ever wow. like so, it was so full on um uh, and then the and again you know for a magazine to be distributed you know nationally you guys were reaching parts of the country where no other hip hop may have existed. I know you'd have been aware of that because you're from outside Cambridge and things have yeah yeah you know, sparsely compared to the cities, of course. But then you had the back, um, the connection section. Yeah. Now this was like a four wheel drive for anybody that was stuck out in the <laughs> sticks, right? <laughs> Absolutely, you know. But um, explain explain a bit about that. What was the uh, the core principle of the, uh, of the connections and connections was was literally just pen pals. It was a way a way for people who were who are isolated, um, or, or 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 maybe not, but just want to meet up with other hip hoppers because you were probably if you if you're into hip hop in sort of eighty eight eighty nine you. You're in. A, you arrive in a very secret club with a couple of mates, or you're or you're on your own, and and so it was just a way of you know, literally using snail mail and exchanging tapes, do, doing whatever. But it was, it was just a way of bringing people together. Mm. Uh, very you know, very primitive and simple, but it, it definitely worked. And I know, but we I think we had a couple of marriages from from Canadians really? at some at some point along the line. So <laughs> we've it. got some photos for it. So yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah seriously. So the Paul H take the shots. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, That's incredible. Did you realise how much of a duty you were doing at the time? I mean, I'm really putting it out there. You genuinely, hand on heart, like you, yeah. you created. You pretty much created me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I have to say, because I, I didn't, I didn't create the magazines. So it was um, a guy called Chris Hunt, right. who who started it, and um, okay. he started it in response to a telephone line, which is. Um, just an opportunity, I think, that one of the guys at Music Maker Publications saw a guy called Mike Marsh, and they had a hip hop connection line, which was basically, I don't know if you remember, this is going way back, this is showing my age, but um, in the sort of 70s, there used mm. to be a thing called Dial a Disc. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so yeah. you'd phone up your 2P two, your two in, mm-hmm. in a phone box, you'd hear whatever mm. record they selected last, last week. So, so hip hop connection phone line was a sort of step up from that, and as Dave Piercing, Bit of hip hop news, but it'd just be a recorded, really? you know, two minute, two minute sort of segment. You're listening to an answer phone, basically, yeah. him saying, you know, public enemy are playing here and there, da, da 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 da, and it would change every 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 week or so. And that was what the magazine was born from: was that enough people were interested and kept on phoning this this phone line. And so, Chris Hunt, who started it, was you know that that was the basis, and and then uh, it was two one off magazines, as one late eighty eight. Mm-hmm. One early eighty nine, and I don't know what they actually sold, but they sold enough from you know to launch it as a as a proper monthly magazine. Wow, 
That's incredible. Mm. To have a phone line that you could call and get like the low down. I know. That is like so good. <laughs> and, and it is, you know, you're, you're phoning an answer, yeah. answer machine. So, yeah. Well, you guys, yeah, um, you guys did it, man. And it, it sparked the imagination. It sparked the imagination. The, the graffiti section in the back, you know, which. Peace book. Yeah. 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 So good. Um, you see, look, if you guys don't know about Hip Hop Connection, then you're somewhere under a rock, particularly if you're British, okay, and you're into the culture. Um, when did it When did it begin? When did it all start for you, Andy? Like, what, what got you into, you know, editorial? What got into, you into, you know, writing for columnists and yes. books? So, I, I mean, I started when I was at college. I was, I was a goldsmith. I um, started 85, I think. But, but about 86, 87, I started doing a fanzine, which is called Only a Rumour. And it was mostly a, it wasn't a, it wasn't a hip hop thing. It was a, a sort of indie fanzine, and I was um, I was doing photography as part of my course. And there's a guy called David Lubitsch who ran Soul Underground, uh -huh. and he was he took loads of, loads of the photos for that. So he was always in the in the dark room, doing doing his photos for Soul Underground, nice. which is this great sort of uh, little independent fanzine. And I saw him doing that, and I sort of sort of clicked this sort of light bulb in my head somewhere that oh right yeah I'm doing photography I should be doing this. So mm -hmm. I started going to gigs doing my own photos and then writing about stuff. And, and so I did this fanzine. Basically, it's all me. I'm spending, you know, most of my college time strapped to the photocopier, <laughs> yeah. putting, this, putting this thing together, yeah. which, you know, 20 people might buy a copy, whatever. So, you know, yeah. but, but it's you, you sell it for 10p at, at gigs. And then uh, 1987, November, um, an old school friend of mine, this guy called uh, Stephen Wollstoneholm, says, you know, there's a gig I think you should go to. Uh, and it's the Def Jam Invasion thing, Hammersmith Odeon, so it's O.B. Rakim, um, LL Cool J, Public Enemy. And he says, you know, I think you're going to like this. And he obviously knows me mm -hmm. sort of better than I know myself, possibly, because, you know, I sort of go along. I've read a little bit about, about them maybe in the anime and stuff like that, but my mind is blown at, at Public Enemy straight away. Mm. So it's just... That know, was a notorious gig as well. Yeah, oh, it's, it's, just yeah. A, it's just a night. Yeah. So, you know... Um, so fortunate to be there. It's just, yeah. just, just, a, just an amazing thing. And really, my, my, my whole music. I'm, you know, I'm 20 years old, so yeah. you don't normally have a, a musical revolution. Your tastes are quite entrenched by that age. But, yeah. but it just really happens. I, 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 I go off on one. So you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still buying kind of indie, indie stuff. But I'm suddenly so, you know, I'm buying Big Daddy Kane and BDP and and, and, and everything else. And, floodgates and, and, open. And basically, yeah. the floodgates open, and I. I changed my fancy and I changed its name to, to White Lie and it's kind of half hip hop, half half guitar stuff and, and you know, no one really kind of gets it at the time. I mean, you know, why are you covering us? Why aren't you? Mm -hmm. Because everything is so sort of ghettoized, for want of a better word. But that's kind of kind of where my where my head is at. And mm. and basically when I'm when I'm trying to find work after college, I, I, I work at Rough Trade packing records into boxes and uh, I have sleeping bag distributed by then. So there's mm. some great stuff. But basically, I'm sending out my fans because I don't know how else to do this. Mm. Just so, you know, here's my stuff. Is anyone interested? Mm. And I get uh, I get a job at Music Maker where Hip Hop Connection is, but not on Hip Hop Connection, on another magazine, a thing called Phase One, which is for, for musicians. But anyway, I, I kind of um meet up with chris and, and mm -hmm. sort of we make a connection he doesn't have any budget to to take on another staff member mm -hmm. at the time but in the magazine i'm on folds literally after three months and i think you know what's well, mm -hmm. me i'm i'm back yeah. out of my ass whatever uh, uh and i talk to chris and he somehow sort of says well you know you, you know your stuff it'd be great to have you on and convinces the powers of be to you know put me on the smallest salary possible but mm. I'm on the magazine and, and, that's, and, and that's amazing so yes yeah, so you got Chris and so the magazine what eight issues old I guess at that point so yeah so eight yeah. issues yeah when you're when you're dealing with uh teams um it's finding people with the right energy i know it sounds silly because you know you put out and you know a request to, to find someone you know for a job and you do get applicants but to find people that really get it like are really like level-headed can deliver targets deadlines da, 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 that's so rare isn't it yeah and it's and, it, and it's really hard you know i know trying to find writers and everything else and, and you get a lot of people who start out really well but they you know, they fade off or, mm. or get flunky quite quickly, and mm. and and you know, I think it took us ages to 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 get 
the team we really wanted on the magazine. I think until the early noughties even. But, but mm. you know, everyone everyone was on board mm. for the right reasons, if you like, or, you know, because we, a lot, we had some really good writers to start with, but because we couldn't pay very much, you know, we, yeah. we, you know, we only had a, a, a small budget, they'd get frustrated maybe after mm. a year or, 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 or you know, have, have eyes mm. on, on, on bigger prizes and go on to, to you know, sort of rock mags and, 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 yeah, and whatever. Totally. So, so we were, I, I tend to think of it in football terms, you know, a bit like, you know, Southampton or something, a feeder club and, mm-hmm. and you know, people play for us a bit, but then they get signed up by, you know, someone a bit glossier. Yeah, well, well they were going away, to big so, things, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. So. Like Mike, uh, well, Nihal, for instance, Mike Lewis... Yeah, there's um, Echo Eschen. Yeah. There, there's a couple of Q editors. Uh, Dan Ruff Styles as well. Yeah, uh, Danny Eccleston, Ted Kessler, they both wrote. Dan so, Green, you know, Dan yeah, Greenpeace as well. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, you know. So many dons. <laughs> They've all gone on to like bigger heights, record labels. Yeah, and, like you know, so, you know, photo wise, <coughs> we only really had a few phases of photographers, but obviously we started with Normski, which yeah. I think. I wrote, yeah, I wrote, a, I wrote a little bit in his in, in his book, yeah, but I saw. think I think that was the biggest signing Hip Hop Connection had mm. at the very start of the magazine was was having Norm Skill on board doing those visuals because yeah. it really gave gave it an identity that yeah. it that it wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah, 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 yeah so. pioneer, absolute pioneer in the game, yeah. and like you say, to have someone of that size, that stature, taking the photos in the magazine, that's just the whole. It's, it's a calling card, isn't it? Yeah, so I, used, I used to see Normski at gigs when I was first going to first going to hip hop gigs, and because I don't look like a you know typical b boy or anything, because I, as I said, I was you know twenty one and got into hip hop, and and I dressed like a, you know as I was twenty, I was already defined in in terms of how yeah. I am in so many ways. But but then people say you know oh you're at the wrong gig or you know or whatever, and I <laughs> I get all this stuff. But I, I, but I'd seen Normski and stuff, and and then um, I I do remember him meeting him at uh, at hip hop connection offices. Mm. In Italy, and him just being this explosion of norm skinness, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of knew, I had an idea of what he was going to be, but he was yeah. about that times about 1,000. A times so, yeah. 1,000, yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. Hurricane Norm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Storms in, so yeah. Wouldn't but, run it uh, any other yeah, way. Yeah. In fact, he was singing your praises very highly. I think it was on his podcast, actually, about the contribution you made to the to the book and even getting the photos and such. You know, yeah, well, I had, I had to... to, to, to uh, I had a, a, some of his archive, just, just a few really early ones right in the back of the back of the back of my shed if you mm. like sort of obscured but but we managed to we managed to get them and get them in the books so it's the main thing that's so, crazy yeah. how, so back of the back of the shed you <laughs> see people you know how much did hip-hop connection immerse your life i mean totally i mean i i i, I we went through a couple of couple of publishing changes and then sort of when we get into the get into the noughties from 2001 onwards I buy the magazine of uh, of Ministry of Sound, having because I, I took it from from one publisher before Future to Ministry mm-hmm. to try and give it a give it a sort of sort of better life for yeah. for, for virtually no money. I think they bought it for a grand, right. and they sold right. it back to me a year later for ten, which is a very Ministry of Sound move. But um, wow. but and, and they put out they put it out to tender, so they put it you know they they, were, they welcomed other bids and wow. and whatever. But I decided. I knew enough about publishing, which I probably didn't, but I, but I decided I knew enough about publishing to give it a go. And uh, so since 2001, and then that last, those last 10 years of magazine, it was pretty much all consuming because yeah. I was doing the publishing as well as, all, as well as the editorial. And I thought I might have known enough, but I really didn't. So, really? you know, we, yeah. were, we were in some, some sort of terrible debt after the first six months on our own because distributors, everyone else, they pay three months later, but you've got to pay for print and everything else pretty much straight away. So, you you know, you sort of... Wow. So, well, it's all sorts of financial shenanigans. And I I mean, I had, I was lucky enough to, to have, have a house. So I remortgaged, I think, twice to just, you know, but, but that means you've got pretty much everything on the line. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, and it was on the line, I think, all, all through the noughties. So I was... Um, yeah, I didn't sleep much because I was uh, yeah. <laughs> crunching numbers quite yeah. a lot of the time. So, yeah. Mm. Wow. Okay, let's get to this. Because yeah. obviously, Naughty's um, sp- spawned the, the new era of uh, how people consume music. Yeah. How people, you know, discover and want to know more about music. Internet is suddenly 
it. I, how's it? Is that the is that the period you're talking about? That what it's what made it doubly hard to kind of keep up with you know. It, it changes. I mean, it, it, it changes. Obviously, everyone is convinced that all record labels are convinced that um, the internet is where it's at, and they start um, deferring their advertising budgets away from print. Mm. And that's that's ultimately why the magazine closes in in two thousand and nine. Is that pretty much we we rely on on a certain amount of advertising yeah. money coming in not not even a massive amount but yeah. it, it just went they yeah. just just label said no we we we're, we're doing we're putting it all online we're not advertising in magazines anymore yeah. i think echoes blues and soul went in the same month That's we right. did yeah, so yeah. yeah so as i recall it it was like cut and off we, the and we, it was just you know we were going to lose so much money per issue mm. it just it just we, and we we had been and you know yeah. there was a point where it just there was just no way we could do it so yeah, yeah. you know and and it was with the, the sort of heaviest of hearts. But yeah. uh, um, Philip, who was a the deputy editor, did do a little online version. But again, of a record label said they were putting all their money into in, into online. Mm. They didn't put it into that. So it, you know, it was you know, it was more a, a spectral promise, I guess. So, um, yeah. Wow, yeah. Interesting. Uh, give me okay. So at its peak. Okay, a couple of, couple of questions here. Right, firstly, the day in life of, of um, Andy Cowan, uh, peak hip-hop connection. Day in, I mean, day in life is it, really getting up six o'clock in, in the morning. Six o'clock in the morning. Because it's trying to, trying to get some stuff done before the telephone goes and then before email goes. So, so mm. these, these things will, will be going all day and then that's a lot yeah. of negotiation. It's just in terms of dealing with words. Do you know doing doing some editing while it's quiet? So yeah. yeah. So what doing editing while you're not on the phone? I mean, yeah. it's a mad delegation, de delegating time through the whole day and space to be able to put the creative touches to something. But in yeah. the meantime, you you're trying to negotiate an advertisement deal whilst you know, like you say, yeah. four hours ahead, eight hours back. Whoever you're having conversations with on the phone it might be another part of the world. Yeah, you you, you are multitasking, and there are times you just say, you know, you turn your phone on because you you're never going to get anything done. You just have to, you know, hunker down. But um, you know, what did your family say? What did your family say at its peak? Like what? Did, 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 hardly anybody saw you. <laughs> It's, I mean, it was all right. We just, you know, it, it just it just becomes part of what you do. So it's just how how it happens and, and you, you negotiate around it and you, you work around it. But, yeah, I mean, you know, there, 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 were, there, were one, there was one thing where I had this one sort of beacon of light, which is December, we do a double issue. Nice. And so we do, and I've, you know, so twice, you know, twice as many words yeah. and photos, say, but, but now I'd, I'd have a few weeks and I could just recharge and, and just, you know, sort of... Uh, Switch, switch everything off, and mm. go go offline almost completely, and, yeah. and, and and do that. And that was that was my little you know little light in the dark, a little salvation from work. But I don't you know I I don't want to say it's all stressed and it wasn't fun or anything like that because it was it was amazing you loved fun. It. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely loved it. And you know, certain times you're getting such amazing music yeah. through the door all yeah. the time. I and mean, I think you know there's a time sort of. Early nineties golden age, ninety three, ninety four, ninety five, ninety six, where every single album coming through Banging. is amazing, yeah. and, and and it's superseding the last one, yeah. and you know, and it's just an incredible, you know, an incredible moment, and incredible to be able to mm. to talk to artists around that time 100%. and then sort of stuff, and it's a bit before things get a bit corporate, uh, yeah. and you know, we can build up personal relationships with artists and everything else. We don't rely so much on record labels and intermediaries yeah. and and PRs. We get to you know, artists will give us decent amount of time and stuff. Yeah. You know, I remember the first Public Enemy interview, which was a which is a dream just to just to meet Public Enemy. And mm. this is, well, it uh, comes back full circle when you're yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, and and so it is you know, Peterborough Leisure Centre of all places, and they're <laughs> just gearing up to to Fear of a Black Planet. It hasn't come out, so oh my goodness, just, just before that. Oh. Uh, and wow. Uh, interview with Chuck. I mean, we basically we talk until we run out of cassettes, and and that's that's kind of how how it goes. And Chuck is so you know Chuck loves the magazine anyway, and, and was always amazingly generous and gracious with yeah. his time. And then and, and we, so we we do that. We run out of tapes, and he says, uh, "I want you know I, I, I want to make a call to uh, to Ice Cube, who's uh, who's just done America's Most Wanted oh, with the Bomb Squad." So, oh, so, it. 
So we go back to, to Chuck's room. You know, he shares a room with Terminator X mm. at this point. They, they, they sort mm. of together, they have a little conversation. No words, because Terminator X speaks with his hands, yeah. gets the keys, go, go, <laughs> up to, go, go up to his room. And, um, and then we're chatting to Ice Cube for, for, for 20 minutes, getting a getting sort of lowdown on America's Most Wanted. And oh. it's, just, it's just like a this ridiculous, heady mm. night of one of the first sort of, you mm. know, sort of, sort of major interviews you'll you ever must do. Have, and, you you must... and you just, you know, times times like that don't really roll around no we don't really want to get roll around now so you know so, yeah. is that one of your like most hip-hop moments ever that's got to be it's got to be so yeah it's, it doesn't it's just, get more because yeah just fantastic <laughs> so yeah. can't possibly i was gonna ask you i mean what other highlights were there i mean that sounds seismic that's a yeah that's huge but what what other ones where you could say to yourself that's a pinch me moment um i mean there's there's some there's, there's some strange ones. There's, there's sort of um, walking down Broadway in, in New York, and um, I think the rapper calls us Scaramanga, but mm -hmm. the, just coming down behind me, grabbed me from there, and go, fuck you, motherfucker. And I just interviewed him <laughs> um, 13 minutes before no in, in Walks. It was just a joke. Cause okay. it, you know, right, was it, just, good... it was just, but uh, that, that was, you know, quite it's a. Damn New York <laughs> sense of humor in types people's yeah. like, <laughs> ski after death. But that was, that was I mean, uh, there's, so, there's so many early interviews and stuff where, where we had, you know, with sort of, sort of De La Salle and people, even, even actually later on, if we go into, into the noughties, we go into. Fifty Cent and we're doing the mm. first doing the first interview around Get Rich and Die Trying, wow. and he was, I was surprised how accommodating and, and how brilliant he was. He really knew mm. how to, in an old school sense. If you think of people like Keris Warren or, or Chuck Warren, they they know what you want in terms of copy. You can see the paragraphs almost writing themselves when you do the interview. Mm. And I think Fifty Cent was of, of modern rappers. He kind of had a sense of what to say and what to do and, and would answer anything in, in, a, in, a, in a slightly sort of, sort of toothsome Greenwich way, but he knew he knew what to do. And, and, and it's kind of nice when artists have, have that sort of awareness of themselves. Mm, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. He's got... Have you checked out his book? Which one? one? Uh, the more recent one. I no, I haven't read the recent yeah, one. Really no. yeah, 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 yeah. I've so. been listening to the audio book version. It's really good. Yeah, I can imagine he's very uh, targeted and... Uh, I mean, very, very bright, marketeer's yeah. brain completely, which obviously obviously we know, but I mean, I think he, he kind of over-marketeered himself, mm. possibly with G-Unit after the first album and stuff, but yeah, he was yeah. a bit too much in your face all the time. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's kind of all, wasn't he? But these, these um, must be on archive somewhere. I mean, you must have loads of tapes, tapes of people's interviews. Yeah, I've got a, got a, I've got a ton in the attic sort of really? somewhere, which I probably should... Digitise. Um, you uh, have got yourself uh, a podcast uh, and a half point. right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. That would be incredible. And I know, you know, I know all the writers do as well. So you know, we've got, we've got, we've got something. So yeah, yeah. That, that could could work in an audio sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's been ticking over my my mind the last couple of weeks is just doing a hip hop connection book mm -hmm. because two yeah in in two thousand twenty nine wow. or sorry two thousand twenty eight it'll be fortieth anniversary. Of the mag, so wow, and it's working out. It's actually working out how to do, how to do it because I could do a book of my my memories, but I think it's really one dimensional, one thing. What if I can get do a sort of oral history and get everyone who's been involved through all those different eras, including readers, including you know sort of sort of uh, artists who used to read the mag, whatever, and and, and make it a real sort of three hundred and sixty. It could be, could be really, really good. So, yeah, that yeah. could be incredible. Yeah, can you imagine? Somehow, yeah, like, uh, like, uh, what's the name? Um, there's Wicked Ronnie Stone's um, movie, um, Exile on Main Street. I think it's a, the, the documentary. Yeah, yeah. But the way they cut and paste and collage. Does Scorsese one? Or yeah, it? I think yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. That's the first thing that came to mind. It's like this kind of hodgepodge of all different eras that are mapped out in a particular way. Um, you could have a book version, you could have a video version. Oh, I mean, you know, like, if hop connection. I didn't even consider the, the, the audio thing, actually, but there's, there's probably, yeah. there's probably quite years. a lot in that. So, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and this is the thing, content is king. That's what we've been taught for yesteryear. Like, you were kind of ahead of the curve with that. Like, for you to have all of that on archive, that's content to die for. Yeah, on the other side, I mean, there's the whole magazine archive in itself, mm. which which is dormant at the moment, but mm. it doesn't mean it won't be so, yeah, so... What's the scariest moment that ever happened? 
where you're just like, oh my god, make this stop. <laughs> oh well, well we'd, we'd had to stop publication a few times, and we've, really? we've literally been been down to down to the bone and beyond the bone on 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 on, on cash, and, and really? just just thinking, well. You know, there, there is no way forward, and, and I'm going to lose everything. I lose my house. Going to, yeah. going to, you know, so it's so, sort of, we're done. Um, as a couple of those, couple of really, you know, sort of, sort of, head in the hands, total despair, sort of, it's over, sort of moments, and somehow, somehow, we brought it back. I mean, I think I, I knew when when we did close that, you know, it really wasn't going to come back, and 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 you know. Mm. From from experience, you just you just kind of you just kind of know you know there's not going to be some sort of magic wand where where mm. there's going to be enough money to do it. But it was, the only way we could have done it was to not pay writers, to not pay photographers. Mm-hmm. But I, for me, I I don't like that model. I, I think you should pay mm. people for what they do. So I, um, I'm kind of old school mm-hmm. in that respect. Even if you know you, can, you can't pay them as much as you'd like, you should. Everyone should get rewarded. Yeah. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, um. What kept you going? What because ki- it's a long time. You guys were doing it for a long, long time. What what kept you going? I think it's just the music. Once when once you're in it, and once you're once you're writing about it, once things are developing, mm. it's you're always looking for what's coming next, what's coming around the corner. Mm. Um, you know, it's it, it's always there's always something good good coming, and you don't mm. want to you don't want to miss out. So. Um, I still write about music now. I still write about hip hop for for, yeah. for for Mojo and stuff. And and if I was sort of denied that that sort of that oxygen of hearing new sounds mm. and 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 getting things up front, I you know I think my life would, would feel sort of um, bereft in lots of ways. So so it's all it's always there's always yeah. something coming. Um, yeah. And I think whatever era of hip hop and hip, you know, it's been you know probably for its poppiest era. In the last ten years, in mm. some respects, but there's always something else. There's always a different level of, of stuff going on, which which is amazing. So yeah. you know, new genres, new yeah, yeah, and, and and just just artists who 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 pop up. So I mean, this year, I kind of miss his early stuff, but I've been into Billy Woods uh, uh, okay. and all of that stuff, yeah, yeah. and he's you know, it's real sort of underground rap, but really mm. really intellectual, some amazing concepts and stuff, and that kind of reminds me of you know. Raz cares, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Early, early, early doors and, and all that sort of stuff. So just, think, just fantastic. I think mm. that's the problem, really, in my mind. And I don't think it's an age thing. I think with the wake of social media being the, the main driver of young people, artists, people in general, putting music out, it's almost like they go straight from what we would perceive as a demo yeah. to public you know, elation. You almost release your demos anyway, yeah. don't you? Now, so you release everything yeah, so yeah. as as one of singles. So yeah. yeah, so people are starving for attention away from the socials, but there isn't anything out there really. I mean, okay, there was there was different blogs, and you know, when hype beast was a thing and such. Yeah, but it just it just feels to me like it's so congested out there. I mean, there must be loads of artists that you see, and you're just like, man, I wish I could write about them right now. You know, I'm sure you go through that most days. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. It's so hard out there to to get to for people to, to you know to narrow their field and get you know the the interview or article that they want because there's not enough publications around, is there? Yeah, no, no, no. and I, you know, I mean, it's it's weird, isn't it, in a way, because British hip hop has become sizable in a way it didn't when when there was print media mm. kind of supporting it. it it kind of it kind of bypassed bypassed that not you know not not by design but mm. it's the way it's the way it actually happened and you know i think we if it was a hip hop connection now as a print magazine we'd have an absolute field day yeah. you know it's sort of you know in in terms of what we could do what we could write about how we could cover things oh, and, and you know, you know. bring it back bring it back <laughs> <laughs> If there's someone with money who wants to talk about it, you know, I, I wouldn't be averse. So, no, really? Yeah, yeah, seriously. But I, but I haven't got the funds to to finance it myself. So yeah. does it come yeah. at a cost? I mean, remind me, you know, especially in 2024, like what, what? magazine. Yeah, they're, they're, they're really, them. really expensive to produce. Really, it's it's not so much the editorial, not so much the photography, not so much staff, but it's printing mm. costs a fortune. Distribution takes half your half your money straight away, and you have 
you 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 basically pulp mm. more magazines than you when you will ever sell. So 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 most magazines pulp about fifty percent or over. So you have to print, you know, sort of over double of what you're going to sell. So if you just imagine the cost of that and the, oh paper, the paper costs of that and everything else, so the financials are tricky. So yeah, yeah I so, bet. So. Even in now, even in 2024, it's, that's a sizable amount of that's a sizable amount of pul- pulping. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, it's a very wasteful, uh, wasteful way unless you can you know find a way of direct sales. But again, mm. you're probably talking. Something that's not going to work on a on a on a national level, mm. really, in terms of subscribers and so on. So, yeah, I stay, opt- yeah. I stay optimistic. I mean, <laughs> and if you're out there and you want to start yeah. putting some money into some publications, and is your man favorite moment in who's your favorite UK hip hop artist that you say, yeah, but I always love chatting with him or having him in the magazine or you know always get a good energy from that person. You know, back in the day or now, whoever. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a there's a few I, mean, I think in terms of in back in terms of back in the day in terms of people who are great to talk to there's there's people like mc duke who's, mm. who is uh amazing yeah. uh, mc mellow mm. who could spin concepts that you've you know for, for hours in a brilliant way and an amazing amazing poetic force uh i was a big fan of of gunshot as oh. a, a, a as a band and that, yeah. that sort of that early britcore britcore thing which just even listening to it now, it, it just really gets you up and going. Love it. So much energy. Yeah. So it's absolutely brilliant. Um, I think musically, my favourite British artist, probably Roots Maneuver. Mm. Um, just can't front on the no. consistency of the brilliant records, the brilliant production, his own his on, on, on so many mm. and the voice completely. So, I mean, you know, it's, I know he had a bad car accident or or something because it hasn't been a Roots Maneuver album for it several years no, a long that. time so, been car accident, yeah right? I think so so okay. but um yeah I'd love to hear some 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 new Roots Maneuver that'd be amazing wouldn't that but, be incredible yeah. and Witness of Fitness probably the UK hip-hop anthem I, 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 I guess so yeah. Easy. Yeah, 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 yeah I would say yeah yeah uh Detwork South East Black Twang yeah again fantastic yeah. so yeah so yeah. oh man I mean I don't know who coined it but he was like, it was the Illmatic of the UK, wasn't it? Yeah. Without question. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, um, and we've got to say, I've forgotten Blade, which we, yes, we have to Blade, talk about. Yes. I mean, Blade was yeah. doing stuff around sort of New Cross when I was at college. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> buying records uh, off the street from him, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, so, so, yeah. so, 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 you know, Blade a massive pioneer mm. and, and, you know, such a driving force and finding a way of doing it yeah. independently, the first real sort of, sort of DIY, wasn't he? So, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of set precedence, didn't it? Yeah. The whole... Doing crowdfunding before crowdfunding. the concept. Yeah. So, yeah, so... Um... God, that's good. Yeah, really. Um, as, was there any... Because, you know, stick with the Illmatic Network Southeast theme, but is it, was there anything that you know, got lifted from the magazine um, and made kind of public that you, you know, you'd tip your hat and say, yeah, I, we did that. We made that. It was, if it wasn't a quote, it was, you know, the the extra value of record sales for a particular person because cause you did something in the magazine that just made it pop. Yeah, I, I can't think of a, a, a specific thing, but I, I just think with a lot of times we... We got to people, we got to artists, we got we championed things a long, long way before anyone mm. else did. And I think that was more what we did in terms of having our, our antennas up and, mm. and, and trying to trying to find those points of difference in terms of finding finding the music and finding artists and, and, mm. and stuff like that. So that was really discovering new artists. Yeah, I mean that that, that that's mm. that was the fun of it for mm. for a lot of us. And you know, trying to write about people first. I know Fat Lace put. Uh, Eminem on the cover mm. about a month before us, but in terms of a national magazine, we we we, we sort of got there. And we you know we couldn't get the couldn't get any, any, any. We had a really strange cover because it was the only, only pics we could find. But uh, and <laughs> it's before he before he went blonde. So really, was, yeah. So it's Eminem with a sort of just with a sort of sort of you know sort of mousy crew cut. But that's uh, so funny. Yeah. I mean, there were some wicked covers as well. I mean. So many just spar on the head like Wu Tang. Did Norm do the Wu Tang photos? So we did a we did this Wu Tang thing. The first the first time we did them, it was just record label shots, right. and, I, and I think it was just a, a phone interview, yeah, or whatever. But then we did an interview. 
I think it was 1993, and it was basically we're taking, uh, it was myself, it was Norm, Angus Beatty, mm. uh, a journalist, and we were taking Andy Cole, who played for Newcastle United at the time, and Kevin yeah. Campbell, yeah. his good friend from Arsenal, and we, we, we met them and took them. The idea was that uh, Andy Cole's a massive Wu-Tang fan, uh, and we get them to, to do this meet-up backstage at uh, Town & Country Club, as, as well as Kentish Town. Uh, and so... All is going well. Uh, Norm sees all set up. Uh, I meet up with with uh, Angus and, and and Andy and and and, and Kevin, and then all hell breaks loose with uh, with Wu Tang, and their road manager, whose whose name I, I, I sadly forget, but but she was she's quite a, this hardened Norwegian mm. uh, uh, road manager. But they had they had this two hour stanging match, uh, saying we're not doing it. We're not. Doing this photo shoot, we're not doing the interview until we, basically until we get some cash. So, so some, 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 just some money so we can go out and get some food, whatever. And and, yeah. and um, it's the oldest, yeah, the oldest old school dispute you'll find between a road manager and a, yeah, yeah, and yeah. a band, except there's quite Classic. a few more Wu Tang yeah. than, than anyone else. Uh, what did Ashley Cole I, say? He was, just, he was just there completely like spinning out. <laughs> and so, so, so Andy Cole and Ken Campbell were quite funny actually. They just sort of sit there and they start doing cash rules, everything around me. They start, they start wrapping it on the stairwell outside. <laughs> so, yeah. and that's a, that's that's a funny. And then, and then eventually we do get in, and so Norsey's doing the photos and stuff. There's some confusion for some reason. I'm introduced as Andy Cole to to. Uh, to Wu Tang Clan, so it's uh, so you go so doing you know, I'm so I'm, I'm do I look like a footballer? I'm saying you know, so, <laughs> it's not me. And, and then we do we do the photo shoot and stuff, and then it's it's actually a really really fantastic Whoa. gig. There's only ghost, yeah. sorry, there's only ODB missing. I think so. Yeah. Wow. So, well, yeah, well, that was a, that was the age old critique of Wu Tang when they first started out. It's there's so many of them. You know, they could, they could change the format of the show, and some people just would never show. Right. Well, you could do. Two gigs in one night, or mm. you could you can do it in ski masks, or whatever, and then you know you can maximise. They 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 quite a few of their early gigs. They had uh, rookies, really, or you know just uh, wider wider Wu Tang members uh, filling Stunt in. Doubles. So yeah, yeah, exactly. But, uh, well, moving moving swiftly into twenty twenty four. This came out twenty twenty three. So we have ourselves the latest book, Andy Cowan, um, B side. Which I'm only guessing it's the history of the B side of the record singles. It's called yeah, it's called uh, B side, a flip sided history of pop, and this was um, it was written in lockdown. Yeah. Um, there you go. So what it was, I just had a bit of a, a bit of a moment in, in during lockdown where I was um, I decided it's a crazy crazy decision that I, I was going to catalogue. I catalog my vinyl. I've got quite a lot. And how um, many? How much? How much vinyl? Has I don't Andy know because I didn't do it in the end. So, so <laughs> I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Okay. But uh, I started, and basically what I started doing, I, I put a few things on a spreadsheet. But I started listening to, to to you know some of the first records I bought when I was a uh, eleven and twelve. And this is kind of you know sort of post punk things. And I was listening to them and I'm thinking the B side of this is amazing. Yeah, yeah. And then oh, the B side of this is amazing. And and. It's just one day. It's just you know. Oh, has anyone written a book about about B sides and and you know the power of B sides? There's so many B sides that have gone on to to change popular music in, in yeah. one one form or another. Um, in rock and roll, you could say Rock Around the Clock, the first rock and roll record, was originally 100%. a B side. Yeah. So was it originally uh, a B side? Yeah. So in disco, you say I Feel Love, Donna Summer again, a B side. That was a B side. A B side. Uh, disco again. You know, I, Glory, uh, Glory Gainer, I Will Survive, another B side. So, so there's, there's, there's a few. You get to hip hop. Um, yeah. You have Sucker MCs, yeah. uh, Run DMC. Wow. You have Six in the Morning uh, by Ice T. Yeah. Um, just this really emblematic song. You have Public Enemy, Rebel at uh, a Pause, starts life as a B side only because they want to get it out really quickly and that's the only way they can. Wow. But it's still, it's unbelievably a B side. So, crazy. so, so. I know a few of these, and I'm looking around. And I think, oh, no one's written a book about it, and I'm, you know, I don't think any more about it. I think initially, but the idea is just sort of tapping in the back mm. of my head for for a couple of months, and it's locked down. It's not much going on, and so I think, well, what's the harm in at least thinking about it? Mm-hmm. And then I start sort of putting together, not writing a book, but just putting together a bit of structure, working out a way of doing it, and then I have, you know, I have a 
spreadsheet sort of sort of going and then suddenly my spreadsheet's filling up with all these B sides which are influential for one reason or another. And I got far too many. Yeah. So and I said, so, well so I sort of do a bit of limiting criteria. So I say, right, one per artist and we can we can get somewhere. And then I I have basically a structure for a book. So a book is an A to Z of five hundred influential B sides and then there's some chapters of different Types of B sides, so it bundles another 160 or so in it. So, has anyone ever uh, told you you're an absolute beast when it comes to this sort of this line of work? It's just incredible. If if, if what connection wasn't enough, and then you've gone into this so, whole other space of, and then so yeah, so 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 I wrote that, and then I didn't have a publisher, but uh, I just decided, well, it's not a good time to approach people, but. Even if I find one, I've got to write it anyway. So, yeah, yeah, so I'll yeah. just go ahead and do it. And then uh, and it took me about a year to write it, but uh, in between other stuff. And then, uh, yeah, and it, and, it, and it happened. So, so, and I'm really, really pleased with it, really, really proud of it. So, who did the artwork on the cover? And Kid Acne, who is uh, an yeah, old mucker from, yeah. uh, from Hip Hop Connection up, and an amazing, amazing artist, amazing yeah. graffiti artist as well. Yeah, um, he's great. Great MC. Um, Good all rounder. Yeah. Really. Loved, yeah. He is, you know, Kid Acne's got. Yeah. Got a new album just out, I think, called Ontology Codes, which is which is yeah, recent, really yeah. really excellent with uh, spectacular diagnostics doing mm. the beats and and yeah, he's you know, I wasn't sure my publisher would go for him doing the artwork and so I, I sort of um, I did a I did a sort of deliberately quite bad mock cover myself and uh, <laughs> and said and then I got I got A, a or B, I, which is uh, on the A side or the B side, I got, I got, I got, I got, uh, got and I got I got Edna sorry Kid Acne to yeah. to do one and said, yeah what do you think and yeah. so, it's got to be this one so yeah, 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 so, yeah. yeah. and he went for it so no I'm so so happy that so happy he did it, he did it. so oh, superb so um, I mean just this looks extremely comprehensive which is very exciting the whole idea of focusing there you go Gangstar Dwick you know. That's yeah. just one page. Just looking at it and thinking, that's I crazy. think there's, there's forty or fifty big big hip hop B sides in there at least. So, it's if you're into music, in yeah, in a wider sense beyond hip hop, mm. or if you're just yeah, just into music or someone you, yeah. you know, you it, know, it, it, it's there's a cure here, you know. There's, there's all sorts of stuff. So it yeah. goes it goes from nineteen nineteen to twenty nineteen. So it's yeah. it's all over the shop. So. You. You strike me as of someone with vast knowledge of music, you know, outside of hip hop as well. Um, just looking through there and all the different genres that you're covering, yeah. and you have them in your collection. That's, that's isn't it strange how your musical taste really? Well, I I find it. I, I've got a wide taste in music, but everything is funneled through to hip hop. <laughs> In its mental state, like the the b boy in me just can't let. You you absolutely can't. I mean, I got I've got into so much music via hip hop. Anyway, yeah. just by samples, just yeah. by just by, yeah, some of those early jazz samples, mm. the gangstar samples. Yeah, so many so many different different strands of music. I'd never have got to if it wasn't for hip hop. So you know, it, it, it's just exploring exploring those breaks, and it's opened so many different yeah. worlds, and. You know, if my friend hadn't taken me to 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 that show back in back in eighty seven, and mm. if I'd have missed that, or you know, weaselled out of it, or or, or whatever, I, I dread to think because that was uh, I didn't even think about it. So I was writing the forward for Andrew's book, and I think, well, you know, if I hadn't, that, my my life really slipped on an axis yeah. there and completely changed and and changed the fans you know I was doing and changed you know everything yeah. completely. So it's weird. Yeah. It's a real sort of sliding doors think, kind of moment. So. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy! I think we all go, we all go through that. That's you know, it takes one thing that triggers. Yeah. I mean, what, what was it for you? What what sort of, what was the spark? Um, well, it's a combination of things. It was yeah. hip hop connection, without question. It was, I think it was the, you had Paris on the front cover. Oh Where, yeah! Wow, sleeping with the the enemy yeah. time. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm. Was, that was it. Was that one? Represent magazine as well, yeah. which had, yeah. which had DITC on the cover. Um. Yeah, just just NWA tapes being passed around in the classroom like like they were some like legal sweets. It was it just it was just a perfect storm. Yeah. Of loads of stuff. And that doesn't mean to say I didn't like it. I was still a I still am a big metalhead fan. I love I love rock and I love punk and I love thrash and anything that, you know, music with balls. But what what hip hop was was the news. Yeah. Wasn't it? It was the news. Every aspect of it was telling not just telling the story. But it was the, you know, 
the extension of the story in the magazine with a deeper meaning of who these people were, but they were telling a story about what they're going through. Just stuff like that. And it really was what it was. It was a window, yeah. certainly for me, what you want to hear when you hear Chuck D talking about stuff. It was a window into a world that we weren't, weren't taught about in school mm. and, we, and we didn't know. And, you know, so, you know, so many, so many lives document, documented brilliantly on, on record anyway. Yeah. But, but, you know, the, the stories go deeper still when you meet the artists. Uh, yeah. and, and, you know, it, it's just really, really incredible, mind blowing, and just musically brilliant, obviously, as well, yeah. which we, we can't forget. And I think that early age of sample based hip hop kind of can't be beaten. Can't to, be to beaten, extent, you know? won't be beaten. You know. <laughs> no way. Bomb Squad, like, it's just a whole nother. It, it's like the, the hummer of, of production, just yeah. like massive tanks coming through. It really, it really is, and, and that layering of sound, just yeah. just, just amazing. So oh, cool. Just alarm bells. and Actually, okay, so definitely DJ Muggs. DJ Muggs, amazing. Yeah. I mean, have you interviewed DJ Muggs? No, but I know you would have done. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I interviewed him actually fairly, fairly recently, and he's the most intense guy i think i've I've ever interviewed because he's so he's so right let's go he's 100 miles an hour really uh, and and he's he's, you know he takes he takes he goes he takes ice baths in the morning and 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 does things to make him feel uncomfortable before he knocks out 20 beats in a day or 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 whatever he does he's insanely prolific (laughs) and so you know if you think i'm intense he's (laughs) four thousand times what i am so you know he's he's but he's incredible what a producer absolutely absolutely yeah off the scale what was the um more recently outside of you know his legacy of cypress hill he also did this other project do you remember with the girl singer I forgot the name. Yeah, I, I know what you mean, but he's also been doing sort of soundtrack horror stuff and and really? all, he's, he's got he's got tons going on, basically tons. So, yeah. Okay, um, RZA, another incredible just, producer, just amazing. Yeah. I mean, if RZA could have stuck to his blueprint, yeah. the idea that he would produce every Wu Tang yeah. album, yeah. and you know, we we got the first four or five, didn't we? So we. Yeah. We got ODB, we got Method Man, uh, we got obviously Wu Tang mm. and, and uh, Raquan, yeah. uh, only built for Cuban Incredible links. Incredible album, so, so that's yeah. And then I, mean, I guess we get uh, Gizza as old genius. We get yeah. Liquid Swords, and then there's no way that RZA can can possibly sustain no. production on that level with everything else that's going on that he has to do no. in terms in terms of. But just for, just within a couple of years, we have the whole. You know the whole sound bed of a Wu Tang established. Who who was who in the Wu Tang established, yeah. Yeah. if you like, as well. But just all of those records yeah. are off the scale. So you know, um, and then we you know later Wu Tang records, some great ones, some Ghostface came back around, yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah but also so. Grave Diggers as well. Like in yeah, and that's and again that's ninety four or something. Yeah. That's still really early. Yeah. So yeah, that came yeah. out of nowhere in my mind. I thought myself oh, G Street as well, wasn't it? That's... It was G Street, yeah. But it did, it did, it did literally come out. No, we didn't know anything about it. And then yeah. Grave Diggers appear, yeah. and uh, yeah, <laughs> Principal Fruit Quan, whatever it's yeah, yes, yeah, brilliant. So yeah. incredible. Um, then Diamond D, you know, I think the West Coast was being hailed up by, by Diamond D and J, J Swift. I think he did the did he do the Far Side album? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 uh, bizarre rides. Now uh, that, so, now that that's an amazing record. That yeah. stands up completely. Yeah. So uh, and has a sort of West Coast sort of answer to De La Soul, yeah. if you like, and then, yeah. and, then, and the Native Tongues, yeah. and all that stuff. So yeah. yeah, just just amazing. I listened to that recently. I know. It's, it's, it's still, still age, brilliant. So yeah, yeah. so it's, it ages good, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I like actually like the follow up Far Side, but it's not. Yeah, it's, not it's, same, a, it's yeah. a different thing. But yeah, it's a different yeah, beast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something about the liveness of the. The first album, I think it was just, just felt like they were all in the room just jamming and getting on. <laughs> well, yeah. They probably, probably were. <laughs> yeah, they could be in the school canteen to some extent. Sort of, yeah, the, the, the good naturedness of the rhymes and everything else. It's yeah. just, yeah, fantastic. See, so, see, yeah. see, and that is exactly what makes a good editor, uh, writer is putting, firing context to to really create a three hundred and sixty picture of what. Yeah, it's like they're in a canteen table, just banging and just being super playful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that that's analogy's how it's awesome. To do it. Yeah, yeah. But love the far side. Love just, the far side. Just fantastic. So. Love the far side. And if we're talking about that era, because you know we stick kind of stick into a certain period of time, you understand. Uh, Midnight Marauders, Q-Tip Production, and Bob Power. Is it Bob Power? Yeah, 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 yeah. <gasps> okay. Well, you're coming. You're on an unbroken run from the Tribe Called Quest. So you've got. Mm. 
I love the first album, People's Instinctive Travels. Mm. You know, the, the, the sort of super laid backness, and you've got um, you know, the sort of the, the stoners follow up, if, if mm. you like, the low end theory, mm. which is just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant record. And then Midnight Marauders, which kind of tops it. You're just going up, up and up. Um, brilliant cover concept, yes. artwork as well. Which is iconic. Just photo, I, definitely iconic. Often repeated, but never mm. bettered. So, yes. Yeah, mm. So. Oh, man, um, and, you know, have you ever done radio? So, no, no, I've done, I've, done, I've done a couple of things, but yeah, but just interviews. So yeah, so, you're kidding yeah. on radio. Crazy articulation, great voice for it. great voice for radio. Definitely do that, Andy. So yeah, I'm thinking of doing a doing a B side podcast thing actually. So that's a great idea. Because if I can get Chuck, if I can get Chuck D, because Chuck D obviously wrote B side wins again. Was my original title for that book, so mm. um, which I wanted to do. But yes, yeah, so so if I can get a few people, I might I might try and do it. It's so, a brilliant yeah. idea. I'll help you all the way. Well, yeah, if you yeah. need help for in a podcaster, I'm your guy. I'd love to. That'd be incredible. Um, so what's the future? What's the future of 2024? 2024. I've got a couple of I've got a couple of book ideas. I mentioned the Hip Hop Connection yeah. one. I'm gonna put that on ice and let that percolate for a mm, little bit because mm. um, it's a bit of time. Uh, but there's I have an idea for a book. I can't really say too much about it, but it's a very deep dive into one artist, one hip hop artist, in particular, a bigger hip hop artist. So Ooh. you can guess, um, and and a bit like uh, B side goes goes very meta and and, and, mm. and goes goes quite deep. This is going to go super meta, so it's going to go really, really in depth in, in depth into. Um, into his career, but it's going to go go around about it in a very, very different way to anything that's been written so far. So, oh, I look forward to that. So, I've got it. It's yeah. It's got it's it's worked out to some extent in my head. It needs to be worked out on paper. Mm. So yeah. So but yeah. So that's 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 starting January, I think. So yeah. So wow. Yeah. No rest for the wicked. Yeah. Exciting times, ladies and gentlemen. My hero, Andy Cowan, inside the place. Uh, round of applause wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you so much for passing through, Andy. Absolutely, my pleasure. It's been, it's been a joy. Yeah, so thank it's you. been great. <laughs> Woo! Happy <laughs> kid inside me. 11 year old guy, absolutely crazy. Uh, I'm sure it's the same for you lot out there. Thank you very much for joining us. You know it is Killer Keller Podcast. Our like him was out of fashion. Sharing is caring, tell a friend to tell a friend. Uh, crime don't pay, but neither do they. Don't talk to anyone I won't, people. You stay lucky now. Peace! <laughs> <laughs> 